I'd like for you to turn to chapter 12 of Revelation. And um, if you don't mind, um, also just mark Daniel chapter 7. We'll actually look at that a couple of times today. At least that's the plan. So Revelation 12 and Daniel 7. And then if I don't, we're again, we're looking at the uh, one-page outline that's front and back. And uh, it probably begins with uh, point number, uh, hang on, point number, you tell me. What does it begin with? Letter B. Okay. All right. Letter C. You are correct. Um, we are going to, so we're, we're going to look at, we're actually going to look at um, verse 5 to begin with. But can I give you, uh, if you want to take notes, or if you're a note taker, can I give you three things that are on your notes nowhere? All right. I, uh, I worked on this this morning to try to come up with a way to jumpstart the lesson today so we could all be sort of on the same page the best we could. So there's really three things, and they each have some little sub things. But you may want to jot these down. This will help. I think this will help us get going today. Number one, the time period is the end of the world. The time period that we are talking about today and next week is the end of the world as we know it now here on Earth. Um, a couple little sub things under that. This would be just prior to the return of Christ to set up his kingdom. Now, I, I want to, you, you, you don't have to jot this down, but I do want to make a point. When I talk about the return of Christ, um, we, we've already talked about some of the different views about the rapture of the church. That is, that is the catching away of the people of God to heaven. And we've talked about, and I'll mention it again today a couple of times, there are differences of opinion as to when that happens. But when I refer to the return of Christ, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about his return to earth where he sets up his kingdom, all right? So, and, and so this is the time period just prior to the return of Christ when he sets up his kingdom. And you may want to jot this down. This is still under point number one. This is the time period after he sets up his kingdom, that Satan will be bound for 1,000 years. It's what we call the millennium. We'll get to that when we get to chapter 20. Jesus will reign on earth for that 1,000 years. And there will be what we call, or what Bible calls, also in Revelation 20, the great white throne judgment. That is where unbelievers will be raised out of hell the living will be judged, but those who are who died that were unbelievers will actually be raised out of hell, stand before God, and then cast back into the lake of fire. All right? So that, that all happens after he sets up his kingdom. So point number one, this is the real takeaway, that where we are talking today is right at the end of time, right before Christ returns um, to the earth. All right. Another little thing that I want to um, say about that, still under point number one, it's, it's actually a point all of its own, I guess. But there's a hint that I've not brought out as well as I should have, a hint that shows up in Revelation often, and we'll see it today. John says, then I saw, just that little phrase, then I saw. We tend to interpret that as, then this happened, and we put it in a timeline, and that's where we get confused. This is not, he didn't say, then this happened. He said, then I saw. In other words, John, the, the, the order of things that he saw does not necessarily represent the order that things will happen. Again, let me put you in, that, in the rotunda of the Capitol building, if I start looking that way, I see that first, and I turn here, and I see that, and then I see that. 
but it doesn't mean that's the order that things happen. This is the order that he saw things, okay? So that's why we, some of the interpretation of Revelation has been a little weird is because we've tried to, every time we see John say, then I saw, we think that means the next thing that happened. It's not always the case. Does that make sense a little bit? So that is kind of a helpful, I think a helpful clue to interpreting Revelation. So that's point number one. That was a lot for point number one. Um, well, uh, point number two builds on the time period thing. So I, I want to be more specific about this time period now. We will hear phrases like 42 months, 1260 days, three and a half years, and we've also heard this phrase, time and times and half a time. So time, times would be one times, two times one, that would be two times, and then half a time. So you add that together, it's three and a half. It's another way of saying three and a half years. So you will, in this period, we're talking about period of time that scripture identifies as 42 months, three and a half years, 1260 days, time, times, half a time, all of that. That's the same period of time. That's the period of time we are talking about today and next week. All right. Is that, again, I just want you to know, so don't, we, I just want us all to jump in and know that we're looking at these, this last period right before Jesus comes back. All right. Whether that's a literal three and a half years or whether it's just this concentrated time period, that's really irrelevant. We're looking at the last time before the return of Christ. And I'm only going to bring this up, the question that we have talked about several times. So who are the saints? Because the saints are all over this text, all over it. Everywhere we turn, they're saints. So the question is, is that the church that didn't get raptured before the end of time? Possibly. It may be. There may The rapture may not happen until the end of the tribulation. There's no absolute certainty. Or it may be people that got saved after the rapture. Um, I, I have my own kind of leaning. and uh, but, but again, we're not, nobody, nobody that's really smart is going to be dogmatic on this because we don't know for sure. But but the point is, there will be Christians, many of them, at the end of time, all right, before Christ returns. Whether these are the Jews that get saved, whether it's all of us, and we didn't get carried away, that that's, we don't know. But there will be a lot of believers in this last period of time. That makes sense to everybody, all right? That's, that's as far as um, really any... Bible student ought to be comfortable saying because we're not given absolute clarity on that. Now, chapter the third point, I want to talk a little bit about chapter 12 because we're going to finish chapter 12 today. Chapter 12 is really about, and maybe you want to write this down, what, what is it that precipitated this end of time battle. I'll just call it that for now. We're not talking about Armageddon. We're talking about this tension that goes on between Satan and believers. So chapter 12 is about what precipitated, what caused this intensity that's going to happen at the end of time. That's what chapter 12 is about. Now, saying that, and we're not back to the notes quite yet, but there, we, we looked at last week, chapter 12 begins with a woman, all right? And we talked about that woman represents the people of God. It, maybe for some, it's the nation of Israel. Some, it's all of the people of God, the church. I think it may be more likely that. But there is this woman who is getting ready to give birth to a child, all right? That's how, again, this is imagery. It's apocalyptic. So we know that. And she's getting ready to give birth to a child. And there is a dragon that's clearly Satan, ready to destroy the child as soon as it's born. All right? 
So this chapter 12 is this, this really powerful imagery of what caused the intensity that's going to come at the end of time. I don't, I don't think, I mean, John, look at John or Revelation 12, um, and um, he will say, I guess I can't pick one out, but, but he, is, he is saying, I saw, I saw this picture. What he is seeing is what was the precipitating cause of this end time conflict. And I talked a little bit about it at the end last week. This is ultimately the cause is all the way back to Genesis. God created Adam and Eve. He gave them one rule. Satan, the serpent, deceived them. They broke the one rule. They're kicked out of the garden. They recognize their nakedness and they are shamed. Thorns and thistles start coming up in the garden. She experiences pain in childbirth. Their bodies begin to decay because they're no longer going to be immortal. From dust you are now to dust you're going to return because of your sin. And God kicks them out of the garden. He curses humanity, and we are still under that curse. No matter what anybody tells you, we're still under that curse. We're waiting for the redemption of the body. Anybody who is my age or older this morning knows that we are still under that curse when you got out of bed this morning, right? You know you are, all right? You can lie all you want and confess all you want, but I'm just telling you, we're still under that curse. We are waiting for that curse to be removed, all right? So, and God then looked at the serpent. He said, I'm not just cursing humanity. I'm cursing you. You have, you've made an impact. You have bruised the heel of woman's seed. And I'm going to, woman's seed is going to crush your head. That was the promise, Genesis 3.15. And from that point on, Satan has known that there is a calendar appointment for his head being crushed. He knows that he is going to ultimately be destroyed. So the story of the Bible is Satan trying to destroy, it's the dragon trying to destroy the seed of God. It has always been the case. That is the precipitating event. And the closer we get, and when we get down to the last 42 months, he is going to crank it up because he wants to do everything he can to destroy the people of God. All right? We talked about last week that there were only 70 Hebrews that were carrying the seed from which the Messiah would come, the seed that came from Abraham and Isaac and then Jacob. There were only 70 of them left, and they're all about ready to starve to death, and the seed would have been destroyed, but God had sent Joseph ahead to preserve a posterity so the people would be saved. We talked about how for 430 years, all of that seed, they were slaves in Egypt, and it looked like they were going to be destroyed as Pharaoh and his army came after them, but God drowned Pharaoh and his army in the waters of the Red Sea. We talked about how that when Jesus was born, Herod was so angry that, that the king of the Jews was going to usurp his power that he made an edict that every Hebrew child that was two years and under, be dis male child, be destroyed and God gave a dream to Joseph and said, get to Egypt. But he was trying to destroy that seed. Does that make sense to everybody? So that's the picture of Revelation 12. That is the precipitating event to what makes the end times so, so intense. Now, go back to your Bibles, and uh, let's look at Revelation 12. And let me read... Let me just go ahead and read the first six verses. We've all already covered at least four or five, maybe even six, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about five and six. Um, so Revelation 12, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, the moon, and under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns 
seven diadems on his head, his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God in his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. So you all were hollering at me a minute ago. You, your outlines start with letter C that says war in heaven. Is that right? Okay. Um, I'm not sure that I covered uh, the last point uh, right before that, just a little bit last week. So if you want to just jot down above that, it, it would be just the, the number four, God delivers, in verse five and six. So the woman is getting ready to give birth to a man-child in verse five. And the question is, who is that man-child? And um, there's lots of debate about that. Some people think it's the 144,000 Jews. I think the simple, and I, I, I remember saying this last week, so maybe we did cover it. But I think the simple explanation is this is Christ. It's, it's he is the one. You look at Psalm, you may want to jot this down, Psalm 2.9 and Revelation 2.27 and then Revelation 19.19 19 and 20. It describes Jesus as the one who would rule with a rod of iron. So it makes sense that the, and it makes sense in the, background that I just gave you, it's always been Satan's desire to stomp out that seed, and Herod was making that attempt to destroy the seed, and the Jews were making that attempt when they put Jesus on the cross to destroy that seed. So again, you see the background is Satan is trying to destroy the one, the, the child that would rule with a rod of iron, and so Calvary would have been that last attempt. So what? look what happens in verse 5. So she bears a, a male child who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron and her child. And by the way, um, depending on what version you have, child might be capitalized. If it's capitalized, that means that the person or the people or the team that was they were the editors for your version of the Bible, mine included, they decided that child was Christ. That's why they capitalize it. All right. That's. So that is kind of a, a fairly typical view, but that child was caught up to the throne. Think about this for just a moment, how perfectly this fits the narrative, the story of the New Testament. So Jesus is born, and the dragon tries to destroy him. God says, Joseph, go to Egypt. And then he lives for 30 years, and then he starts his ministry. And at 33, Satan tries to destroy him on the cross. Three days later, he's raised, and 40 days later, look at verse 5, he's caught up to the throne of God, right? He, he ascends. So this fits perfectly. This was, and so and what happened after that? Look, look in at verse 6. So the woman then fled, or the church fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her 1,260 days. So. Satan, we'll see it in just a moment, but he tried to destroy the male child that would rule with a rod of iron, Christ, and um, but God catches him up to the throne, and ultimately we will see then that the dragon will turn his effort toward the seed of the one caught up to the throne. That's why the church was persecuted in the first century. That's why the church is persecuted today. That's why the church will be persecuted at the end of time in greater measure because Christ ascended, but we are heirs and joint heirs of Christ. We are his offspring, and so Satan has turned his attention on us. All right, that's exactly what this is describing. All right, so Satan turns on the offspring, but they flee. Let me give you, a, I'm still on the point before C, all right? Um, when uh, Nero destroyed Jerusalem, um, 
and, and actually before he destroyed Jerusalem, in about, you may want to write this down, you may not, about A.D. 66, um, he destroyed or he started persecuting Christians and many of them fled into the wilderness of Petra. Look at me for just a moment. Let me make this point. This prophecy, um, this prophecy has an absolute fulfillment in the last time, but it had many fulfillments along the way. As I've already said, Satan has always tried to destroy the seed. And so the first century that reads this, they've been under the, the um, attack and the persecution of the Romans. That's how they're reading it, and God is protecting them. So they actually fled into the wilderness of Petra. Jesus talks about that in Matthew chapter 24, but God protects his people, all right? Now, let's go to verse 7. This is letter C on your one-page outline, um, and here is a war that is described that takes place in heaven. The war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan. So this is where we get our certainty that the dragon is Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Now, remember what I said in one of the points that I gave you, chapter 12 is an explanation of what precipitated this end time intensity. This is describing a war in heaven. A few things I want you to notice. Number one, this is what happened in heaven. Number two, notice there is no, this is important, there's no dualism here. The battle is between Michael the archangel and Satan. It is not a battle between Satan and God. You all understand God is God and Satan are not like almost equal. Did everybody get that? All right, Michael is an angel, Satan was an angel. The battle is between them. And sometimes we almost think that God is battling against Satan. God has already destroyed Satan. The Bible makes that really clear in the cross the principalities were destroyed, all right? Now, do we have full application of that yet? No, but he has already, the victory has already been won. So there's no dualism going on here. Now, some see this text, and, and I can see it, as a description of everyday spiritual battle. And, and I actually would not say that's wrong. I think that's accurate. Um, listen, Paul said in Ephesians 6, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers, all right? So, again, I'm just telling you, this has always been going on. This is from that day that God said to the serpent, you want a small little battle, but you're going to get defeated. He has been doing everything he can, and he has been wrestling, and his demons and his principalities have been wrestling against the people of God. So this does describe an ongoing battle that, that is taking place in the heavenly, there's some interesting texts. We won't go there today. But Daniel, when Daniel tried to pray, there's a wrestling match going on in heaven between Michael and, and the prince of Persia, which is a, a, an angel that's fighting against him. And Daniel's prayer couldn't get answered until Michael overcame. So this is a picture of the spiritual battle, the spiritual warfare that's always been going on. But I would argue that even beyond that, there is a, a precipitating event that causes that ongoing battle, and that would have been what we call the primordial fall, the fall before creation. So I told you to turn to Daniel earlier, but how about Isaiah? Why don't you go to Isaiah? We'll get to Daniel later, maybe. Um, Isaiah 14 and verse number 12. Isaiah 14 and verse 12. Isaiah 14, 12. How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations? 
For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mounts of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. All right. I won't read any more of that to you right now. But that and also um, Ezekiel 28 also describes what looks to be the fall of Satan. And what was the fall of Satan all about? Satan said, I'm going to be like God. I want to be worshipped. I'm going to ascend to the mountaintops. I want to be like God. And he fell. All right. That's Isaiah 14. You'll also see that in Ezekiel chapter 28. And when he fell, we know from several scriptures, again, we're not going to, the point is to stay in Revelation as much as possible. But when he fell, he took a third of the angels with him, which again is what is described. Look at Revelation 12 and uh, verse number uh, nine, the dragons cast out uh, the old devil of old, the serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the world. He's cast to the earth, and the angels are cast out with him. So there was this primordial fall. Let me really, how many, how many are okay if I really muddy the waters for like 60 seconds? Can I do that? All right. So if you if you are really a, an astute reader, when I was reading Isaiah 14, it said that when Satan fell, he weakened the nations. Well, if this is a primordial fall, what nations did he weaken? I mean, nations seem like they would need people, all right? I don't know. I'm just, I'm just throwing this out. All I'm doing, I'm just trying to mess with your head, okay? That's all I'm trying to do. Um, there, is, there is a great argument to be made. Um, it's called the gap theory. Um, Genesis 1, 1 says, in the beginning, God created. This is why I never finished anything, because I always go down these rabbit trails. Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the next verse says, and the earth was without form and void. And the, the, in the Hebrew, it literally means the earth was chaotic. There are some people that think, did God create a chaotic, chaotic earth? So some people think there's something that caused the earth to be chaotic. And, um, and then what we get from beginning in verse 3 of Genesis 1 is God's recreation of the world. And uh, you think about this. What did God tell Adam and Eve? Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Um, I don't know how you replenish something that wasn't plenished to begin with, right? So there is an argument to be made. Again, there's an argument to be made against it too, but I'm just trying to mess with your heads. I'm not trying to just answer anything. There is an argument to be made that, that there was some kind of creation and, um, and then Satan fell. And when he fell, he weakened the nations, destroyed, uh, Ezekiel says, um, and, and the uh, cities were made like the wilderness, that he fell, created chaos. So God created heaven and the earth. Genesis 1-1, one, one, and then Satan fell between 1-1 one, one, and 1-2. One, That's the gap. And then 1-2, the earth is without form and void, and then God began to recreate. Now, it doesn't matter because the story we're responsible for is what happened once God recreated and made Adam and Eve. So all, all I'm doing is, um, well, you know what I'm doing. I've already told you what I'm doing, all right? So... If you, if you picked up that week in the nations, I was just trying to, in case somebody said, well, what nations did he weaken? That's one of the, the verses we have to work around. And, and that's a, when I say a theory, it's a theological principle that a lot of people hold to. It doesn't really impact this again, but it, it certainly fills in some holes in some of the other things. Even some people even say it fills in holes about fossils and the age of the earth and all of those things. So do with that what you want. But there was a war in heaven, all right? We do know that. Let's go back to what we know for sure. There's a war in heaven, and Satan is cast out. He is the deceiver, the dragon, the Satan, um, the devil. 
Satan is the Greek word, uh, devil is the Hebrew word, but they are both synonyms for an accuser in the court of law. That's what he did. Remember Job? He came to God and he accused Job. And can I just tell you, he hasn't changed. He still accuses us. He accuses us to us, doesn't he? He whispers in our ear and says, you're really not all that. And the blood of Jesus really hasn't cleansed you. And God isn't really with you. Those are all, he's a liar. He's always been a liar. He has always been the accuser of the brethren. He and his angels are then cast out. Now we go to Revelation 12, 10, and there is this celebration. Um, I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and kingdom and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren has, who, who the accuser who accused them before our God day and night, they ha has been cast down and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives even unto death. Um, in verse 12, therefore rejoice, O heavens, you who dwell in them, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath. Look, because he knows he has a short time. All right? Um, so there's a heavenly shout when the accuser of the brethren is kicked out. I, I find that not at all hard to believe that when Satan is kicked out of heaven in the primordial fall, that the rest of heaven celebrate. That makes perfect sense. They celebrate. He's been an antagonizer trying to ascend to the throne of God. There's this heavenly shout being cast out. He is the accuser of the brethren. Um, I'm going to show you this anyway, just because it's really good. But hold your finger in Revelation. Turn to Romans 8. I put it in my notes and wasn't sure if I'd say it or not. Look at Romans 8. Um, it's just a sidebar pastoral note. For those of you who battle with the enemy telling you, accusing you and telling you you're nothing, and that God hasn't forgiven you, um, let me just take you to Romans 8.33, because Satan is the accuser of the brethren. But in Romans 8.33, Paul says, Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Let me just stop there for just a moment. Satan can accuse all he wants, but his accusations are impotent. They have no power. The only one who can accuse is the God who justified us. And look at the next verse. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. This is such a great truth. I, and I preached it before, but I couldn't let it go. So Satan accuses us and tells us we're, no, we're of no value and we're really a sinner and God hasn't really forgiven us. Paul answers that. Who can condemn? Only God who justifies. Who, who, can, or who can bring a charge? Only God who just Who can condemn? The only one who can condemn is Jesus because he's the only one that's perfect. Remember, he said, Romans or John chapter 8, the adulterous woman, let, let he who's without sin throw the first stone. They all walked away, and Jesus said, because he was the only one that could condemn, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. So who can condemn? Only Jesus. But what did he do instead of condemning? He died for us. He Look, Romans 8, he rose for us, and he ascended and is seated at the Father's right hand, and he is praying for us. So when you start getting under guilt and feel like, man, I'm nothing, the only one who can condemn you is the one who chose, instead of condemning you, to die for you, be raised for you, and who is currently praying for you instead of condemning you. Isn't that really good stuff? All right, so it has nothing to do with Revelation, but I threw it in there because it's just, it's so powerful. So go back to the notes now. And uh, so there's a celebration. He's cast to the earth. He knows his time is short, but those who overcome, overcome by the blood of the Lamb, which is the cross, and the word of the te their testimony, that's what we're still overcoming by today. We overcome by the blood of Jesus shed at the cross and by the proclamation of the gospel. Uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So 
We overcome the enemy by the blood of Jesus and by the proclamation of the word of God. This is how we defeat Satan. The cross was not a victory for Satan, and neither is martyrdom. If Antipas was in the first century killed, and Stephen was martyred, and thousands of people every day in 2023 are being martyred for their faith, that is not a defeat by Satan. That is a defeat of Satan, because he didn't get them. They overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, and they, martyrs, are in the presence of God. So they overcome. It is not Satan getting a battle. So heaven rejoices, but earth must mourn because Satan knows his time is short and he is enraged. And so the implication is he knows he's running out of time and he's cranking it up. And so there's a sense in which earth mourns because it gets worse and worse and we're feeling it getting worse and worse now. Um, this is the the Fred Craddock quote that I have stumbled around um, for since I started teaching this and I couldn't find it. I finally found it. Here's what he says. John's apocalypse is a call to see through what's going on to what's really going on. That really makes sense here in Revelation 12. All right? Because, and it makes sense in 2023. All right? Revelation, when you feel the pressure and you feel the spiritual warfare, Revelation is an invitation to see past what you're feeling today to what's really going on in the heavenlies. And what's really going on in the heavenlies is Satan lost a battle a long time ago, and he knows his time is short, and he is cranking up his intensity against the people of God. Does that, does that make sense to you? So that's why Revelation, that's why Revelation was helpful to first century Christians. I keep saying this, and it's helpful to 21st century Christians. It's not about timeline. It's about who's in control and who's really winning this battle. And ultimately, Jesus has already won the battle, and we are winning it with him through his blood and through the proclamation of the gospel. All right? Everybody got that? Okay. Now, let's move on. Then there's a war on earth, verse 13. So when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child, but the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that might fly into the wilderness to her place when she's nourished for a time and times and half a time. There it is. Um, so now we're talking about that in time from the presence of the serpent. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood with the dragon and spewed out out the dragon had spewed out of his mouth and the dragon was enraged with the woman and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. If you want a really fancy um, interpretation of that with all kinds of little nuances and pieces that we can't be sure of, I I'm probably not your guy for that. Okay. But, but here's the bottom line is, the dragon, cast to the earth, is angry. He's enraged. And so he goes after the offspring of the woman, the heirs and the joint heirs of Jesus Christ. He spews out this, this picture of um, a flood. It, it, by the way, first of all, this has the, the wilderness motif that we've talked about in Exodus. It, here it is again. It's the people of God coming out of bondage into the wilderness. We have that same wilderness motif. And um, he he's spewing out of his mouth. What does the dragon spew out of? What does Satan spew out of his mouth? He is a liar. He's the father of lies. He's doing that, accusing the brethren. He's, he's trying to deceive people in the last days. It, and, and so again, he's spewing out of his mouth. There's rage and pursuit by the dragon after the woman and her offspring um, who keep the commandments of God and who have the testimony of Jesus Christ. That, I would suggest, is the period of time we are in right now or will be. It'll get intensified as we get to the 
42 months, three and a half years. But this is what's going on right now. Satan is lying. He's deceiving. Um, churches now are preaching lies. They bought into lies. The Bible talks about Thessalonians to be a strong delusion. All these things comes out of the mouth of the dragon, who is a liar, the father of lies. So it is lying, it is deception, all of this. And again, we don't have to we don't have to place this on a timeline because it's not so much a timeline as it is intensification as we get closer to the coming of the Lord. He's always how many believe Satan's always been a liar? He's always been a liar. But but the point that's being made here is as we get closer to the end of time, the intensity of that, knowing his time is short, gets ramped up. And that's exactly what we're seeing. And, and I would guess that if we're still a ways from the coming of the Lord, we haven't seen anything yet. All right. I, I think it's even going to get ramped up more. Revelation 12, again, let me take you to that quote, is a call to see through what's going on to what's really going on. So this is imagery at its best, but it's just saying Satan knows he's running out of time and he wants to take out every person he can who is trusting the word of God and walking in obedience to the word of God. Let me uh, end this lesson not today, but this lesson, um, by just noting the three defeats of Satan, uh, the man-child caught up, that would be the ascension of Christ, his being cast out of heaven, and his lies being swallowed up by truth. And now he is fully enraged. Uh, I made a few closing comments for this lesson, and that is that we cannot be neutral when it comes to Satan and spiritual warfare. He is at work for a short time. He was soundly defeated at Calvary, and he is angry. He will be overcome. Again, I, I, don't, I, I don't mean to confuse, but I, I, I'm not trying to confuse. I'm trying to get help you to rightly divide the word of truth. This wasn't written to us first. This was written to seven churches in Asia Minor. And Ephesus had lost their first love and Laodicea was lukewarm. So it was written to them first. And so he is saying to Ephesus and Laodicea and those other five churches and every church that has existed since then, including ours, you will not be defeated by the enemy if you will stay true to the word, if you will overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of his testimony. It was true for them and it's true for us. Instead of trying to make it something it's not, let's hear it for what it is. There's always been one way, two ways if you divide them into two, to overcome the enemy, and that's the blood of Jesus and the word of the gospel. Does everybody believe that? That was true then, it's true now, and that's what Revelation is saying to us. All right. Now, let's flip over to chapter 13. And uh, we're not going to go all the way through this. We'll just see how far we get. And, uh, and I'll stop at an appropriate time. I will judge the appropriate time. But when half of you walk out, you will judge the appropriate time. Um, but I, 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 thought, I, I think we can now get through 13 this week and next week really easily because I feel like, I, I, and I may be feeling wrong, but I feel like there is a collective understanding that chapter 12 was not so much about a time period um, on a timeline as it was, this is what's been going on. This is why things are bad and have always been bad and are getting worse and worse. Now, chapter 13, um, let me just read the notes. I know it wasn't last week, but let me read it. At the end of last week's lesson, which, yes, Jim, sorry. Jim, when you're that tall, you need to raise your hand more than that. <laughs> I just thought you were scratching your ear, Jim. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. 
Yeah. Right, right. Mm -hmm. First of all, for full in full disclosure, I am not a gap theorist. I don't buy that. I was just that is one of the explanations for how he would have destroyed the nations. But you're absolutely right. That is the basis. I don't know if you heard the question, but. Um, I don't want to, I, I think I can say this as you said it. Jim said, did you read Genesis 1, 1? It appears that the earth already existed um, when God started speaking and he divided um, light from darkness and all of that, but it already existed. And he said, is that the basis for this theology that says Satan's fall? I, I think I'm asking it right. Created chaos and then there was a re- Creation. Is that what you're asking? That is the basis for it. Um, again, it's because of Isaiah 14, which some people argue doesn't refer to Satan at all. Um, Ezekiel 28 is, I, I used Isaiah 14 because I'm more certain that Isaiah 14 speaks of Satan than I am Ezekiel 28. But, but, that, but to answer your question, that is the basis that there seems to have been something existing when the biblical story started that in the hebrew at least it can be interpreted that it was chaotic that it, and that that a god of perfection would not have created in a chaotic form and therefore something took what he had pre-created and made it chaotic and then he redid it or recreated so that is the basis for it i think to go back one step further why did we need that theology. I think people needed that theology because they had a hard time deciphering things like when Satan fell, he weakened the nations. Um, what did he weaken if there was nothing here when he fell? So I don't know if that answers your question. Maybe it puts you at ease since I'm not a gap theorist. I don't, I don't know, but uh, that is the reason. That is the reason. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Ron? Yeah. Well, it's a fair question. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, as I've said several times, there is lots of uncertainty as to whether it's a literal seven years, because Revelation never mentions it. Um, only can we get seven years from Daniel 9. Um, there's lots of speculation as to whether or not there is a catching away of the bride um, because the word rapture is not in the Bible. Um, and um, a lot of people believe that we will go through the end time, whatever that's like, whether it's seven years or the whole thing or and then Christ returns and sets up his kingdom. So I, I don't really know how to answer your question. I, I will say this. The bride that is without spot and wrinkle. The, the next phrase says washed in the blood of a lamb. And the only reason we will be without spot and wrinkle has nothing to do with what we've done good. It's whether or not we have trusted the blood of the lamb. And, and so our righteousness is completely found in him. And that's what will make us the bride that's spotless for him. All right. That sort of helped. All right. Any other questions? All right. Uh, let's go to chapter 13 then. Um, so Satan has declared war on the people of God. We are in this period of time now. 
we are talking again, I'm just going to say it one more time, talking about the end time, whatever that is, whether it's last three and a half years before Jesus comes, uh, whether it's that's metaphorical and it's just a period of time before Jesus comes. And I, I don't, I don't really know. I, I don't know that I need to do this. I'm just going to say one more time. The reason I'm okay with um, saying these time periods can be metaphorical or allegorical or imagery is because all of Revelation is, all right? It's a dragon and a woman, all right? It's not, we all, everybody in this room knows a dragon and a woman. Those are images, right? Please nod your head at me that you know that. It's an image. Okay, so that screams at us, this is imagery language. And so to determine when we get to pick and choose what is imagery and what is literal, I don't feel qualified. I don't know that any of us can be dogmatic and say that's image and that's literal. So um, all I know for sure is Jesus is coming and, and we better be ready and it's going to get worse before he comes and there could be persecution and there are going to be people believing a lie. And that's what was written to the first century. The, the first century was not getting out the, the chart and trying to figure out when this was going to happen. They were just being called to quit compromising and don't lose your first love because there is going to come a time when this thing comes to an end and you better be ready. Does that make sense to everybody? So that's really why um, when I was 25 or 35, I was really freaked out about saying things were imagery. Now that if you fire me, I can retire. I don't worry about it as much. All right. But um, so that anyway. So at the end of the lesson last week, which was five minutes ago, maybe 10 minutes ago now, Satan had declared war on the people of God, the woman and her offspring. This chapter now, chapter 13, outlines his strategy. This is what it's going to look like. Now, now we are really talking about the final implementation of the satanic strategy. And this, I'm going to argue, has not yet happened. This is still in the future, all right? And... Um, He's going to outline his strategy to conduct this war against the people of God, and he's going to utilize two other members of the unholy trinity, which will be the beast from the sea and the beast from the earth. Let me just put this up on the board real quickly, because I'm going to talk a lot about this today and next week. All of us know what we mean by the trinity. That was a loss. All right, number one. Here we go. All right, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. All right, we know what the Trinity or the Godhead is. What we're going to see in the last time is an unfolding of an unholy Trinity, Satan, the beast, which is the Antichrist, and the false prophet. All right, I'm going to talk a lot about that for 15 minutes today and all of next week. Okay, so we're going to see Satan's strategy. And uh, the first beast seems to be the military and kind of the administrative leader. And the second one, will the false prophet, is kind of the head of a one-world religion. We will talk about that more. Um, Flip back to chapter 1 real quickly, if you would. Revelation 1 and verse 4 and 5. Revelation 1, 4 and 5. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. See the Trinity, the one who is, was, and is to come, Father, seven spirits, Holy Spirit, and Jesus Christ, the Son. So the Trinity. And now, go back to Revelation 13. Everything we see about this false trinity will be a parody. Satan will... Um, 
implement a parody of the Trinity or the Godhead. Notice that uh, the authority of this unholy Trinity comes from the dragon and his throne, which is interesting because the early part of Revelation is one seated upon the throne. So again, this is part of the parody. Um, it's it's and it, so it's a parody of Christ as the Son of God. The beast, plural, will conduct the final war against God and his people and will demand universal worship. Again, this is what Satan was shooting for when he was kicked out of heaven, and it would look very much to the first readers like the Roman Imperial Empire demanding emperor worship. All right, that's that's how they would have interpreted it. That's how they would have seen it in the first century. Throughout this chapter, there are parodies or there are imitations for anything that God does as the dragon and the two beasts will try to imitate what God has done perfectly. The beast, which is the Antichrist, will receive a fatal wound and he will be healed, which is a parody of the death and the resurrection of Jesus, the son. The sealing, mark of the beast, is a parody of the sealing of God's spirit on our hearts, okay? Instead of, see, again, not, not that we shouldn't, but we kind of get overly dramatic and spooky about the mark of the beast. But beyond that, it's just a parody of the sealing that happens with the people of God when we get saved, all right? So it's, it's, it's a parody of what God does. So I don't know how far we can really get in five minutes, but we can, um, not that far. I just turned four, four pages. We can, we can see where we can go. Let's, uh, so chapter 13, verse 1, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and uh, I saw the beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads, heads a blasphemous name. Uh, the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear. His mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power. See, the authority comes from the dragon. His throne and his great authority. So again, see the parody. All of, what did Jesus say um, in Matthew 28? All authority has been given unto me. Where did that authority come from? It came from God and his throne. So now the beast has authority from the dragon and the dragon's throne. So you see the parody that, that is going on there. Um, and uh, let, let's stop at verse 2, because that may be as far as we get. Let me just kind of beat through these verses. So in verse 1, I'm reading out of the New King James, and that may be what you have. And so when I read it, it says, then I stood. It sounds like John standing. However, the ESV, um, says he stood, and um, the NIV, and by the way, in the ESV, it's actually chapter 12, verse 17, instead of 13, verse 1, that we're the ones that added the verses anyway, so don't get worried about that. Holy Spirit didn't say chapter 13, verse 1, okay, that's not how that worked, so we added all of those, so don't let that make you nervous at all. Um, the NIV says um, the dragon stood on the shore of the sea. And the NSAB says the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. So most actually believe that that, again, it doesn't really matter, but instead of John seeing um, from the, the shore of the sea, John seems to see a dragon standing on the shore of the sea. And he is going to continue his rage, his war on earth, as in chapter 12, 13 through 17. Uh, his intentions and his initial actions are now going to be seen. We know that he was enraged in chapter 12, 17, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring. So he, he went, and now he stood. All right, the beast is standing. The scene alludes, and this is where I told you an hour and 15 minutes ago <laughs> to turn to Daniel, all right? Now we're going to go to Daniel. This alludes to Daniel 7, 3, where four beasts arise out of the sea, so just turn there, Daniel 7, and uh, I think I'm going to explain this little piece, and we'll probably stop. It'll be a good start, chapter 13. 
uh, Daniel 7, and uh, look at verse number 3. A actually, um, yeah, verse 3. And four great beasts came up from the sea, um, each different from the other. The first, like a lion, and had eagle's wings. Watched till his wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. So we have a lion. Suddenly another beast, like a bear, was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and they said, Thus arise, devour much flesh. For six, I looked, so we have two now, and each one has one head so far. There's a reason for me saying that. After this, I looked, and there was another, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast, this beast, look, also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. This is Daniel 7, 6. Now, now count with me. First beast had one head. Second beast had one head. Third beast had four heads. So what are we up to? Six heads, all right? And then verse 7, and after this, I saw in the night visions... And behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong, and had huge iron teeth. He was devouring, breaking in pieces, trampling the residue with its feet. He was different from all the beasts that were before it. And look, and it had ten horns. Okay, it only had one head. So six plus one is what? Seven. And so we have seven heads from Daniel 7. We have seven heads, and we have ten horns. All right? Now, remember that. So now let's go back to page two in the notes. These four beasts, most likely, and this now, when I say most likely, I'm stepping into the camp of probably about 90% of commentators. So I feel when I go there, I'm pretty comfortable, all right? They most likely represent the four empires that, um, that ruled over Israel. And uh, the first one was Babylon, 586 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar, all right? Then, remember, in the book of Daniel, when Belshazzar, who was the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, was all excited because they were having this party, and then he saw handwriting on the wall, and Daniel interpreted it, and said, tonight your kingdom is going to be given over to the Medes and the Persians. And that night it happened. So beast one is Babylon. Beast two is the Medo-Persian Empire. If you're a history buff, you know what the next empire was that took over the, the Palestine area was the Greek Empire. And then the fourth one was the Roman Empire. They were in power when John is writing Revelation. All right? So those four empires represent, those four beasts represent Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. And so now, let's go back to chapter 13, verse 1. So the beast is standing on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising out of the sea. Look at this, having seven heads. That's how many were in Daniel's vision. And ten horns, ten crowns, ten horns and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. So the beast is standing on the shore, calling forth the agent or agents that will help him in this final battle, uh, the military and the administrative leader for the final battle. He's pictured on a sea, which is the realm of evil, same thing that happened in Daniel, the beasts come out of the sea, especially if the dragon is, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, Leviathan, which was the sea monster of the deep. Um, notice it's kind of a dramatic scene because you almost see, it's like, it's like one of those horror movies. You kind of see the beast kind of slowly rising. Out. Anybody here remember Sammy Terry? Yeah, okay. I, I'm really going to disappoint you, but, um, and mom, I'm sorry to tell them this, but my grandma and grandpa Menard let us spend the night on Friday night and have, have Fago Red Pop Sundays and watch Sammy Terry. Okay, I'm just telling you. So, but anyway, 
I mean, don't you kind of get that picture of the beast coming up out of the sea very slowly? That's the picture, and it has seven heads and ten horns, okay? So, again, note the resemblance of the dragon, Leviathan, the sea monster. The dragon is the emperor of the underworld. The beast is the military power uh, on earth, so he has crowns on his horns. And, again, notice the parody. The beast resembles the dragon as does the son, he is the exact representation of the father, is, is, what, is what scripture says. He is the exact representation of his being. So again, this is a parody. The beast, the Antichrist, is going gonna, is gonna to resemble in many ways the dragon. All right? It, again, it's an allusion to Daniel. I've already talked about that. Seven heads, which is the sum of the heads of the first four beasts, and ten crowns, the number of crowns on the fourth beast. All right, and then go to Dan, back to Daniel 7. You're all saying, Pastor, please quit, please quit. Let me just go a little bit further. Daniel 7 and verse 23. Thus he said, look, this is what's important. The fourth beast, this is an interpretation of that earlier vision. The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which shall be different from all the other kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it in pieces. The ten horns are ten kings who shall rise from this kingdom. In other words, those ten horns are kings that come out of that fourth kingdom. And he shall, and another then shall rise from them. He shall be different from the first one, shall subdue three kings, and he shall, look, speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall attend in Tim to change times and law, and the saints shall be given into his hand. Look, for a times and times and half a time. Three and a half years. Okay, now, let me see if I can put all this together. Um, and then maybe we'll, yeah, I, I'm going to finish this page. Identity of the beast, and then we're going to try to stop. Um, so you all can go to lunch and I can regroup. All right. So, um, so this, the picture that he gets is, is a, is a look back to Daniel four kingdoms. But now he says this fourth kingdom is different like the rest. In other words, the Roman empire, and we know it literally was different than the rest. But what's interesting is it's not only different in its power, but out of that comes 10 other kings. And then out of those 10 comes another one that's really different, and that's the one that makes these pompous and blasphemous remarks about God. Now, amillennialists, those are people who do not believe there is a literal millennium, would say this is just figurative, and it's a symbol of all of the opponents of Christ and his church throughout the ages. I would not say that they are wrong. There is that representation, uh, but I would suggest it is more than that. There are those that can tell you exactly who these nations are. Problem with that theory is that changes all the time. They, you know, that I, I've pastored for 40 years, and I remember when those 10 kings were the European common market, and then that all got blown up. And and so I don't think that's the point for us to try to identify, but I think we can back up away from that and say what it is, is clearly an end time empire that is going to have pictures of the Roman empire. That's not the word I'm really looking for. Have the flavor of the Roman empire, but be greater and more intense than ever. Again, they're, they're writing this and nobody, Daniel's writing this and He's in the middle of the Babylonian or the Medo-Persian Empire. There isn't even yet a Greek and a Roman Empire. And when people in Revelation are reading it, there's only the Roman Empire. So they can't picture this. And so for us, to we, we have history behind us. But again, just like they failed, we shouldn't have to try to squeeze future into it because we don't know exactly what the future is. We know there's going to be this end-time empire. Um, most likely a literal figure um, who will try to control the people of God at the end of the age 
and will try to usurp God's authority. I, I, I know I'm way over time. Just give me grace today. I'm almost done, but I do want to read this scripture to you. Turn to 2 Thessalonians 2, and um, some of you are wishing I was going to Singapore next week. I know. Um, 2 Thessalonians 2, and look at verse number 1. Actually, let's just, let's jump down. I need to read verse one. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you, don't be too shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. If you remember my series last year on Thessalonians, um, some of the Thessalonians thought that they were being told Jesus had already come and they'd missed it, all right? He said, no, Paul said, don't worry about that. Let no one deceive you. By any means, for that day will not come unless there's a falling away that comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, who is the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Um, do not, do you not remember? That, I, I'll just stop there because I, I could get into all kinds of other stuff. But the point is. That, that Paul said, at the end of time, there is going to be one emerges that, that, that will emerge, that will oppose God and will set himself up as God. That's what we are seeing in this beast or the Antichrist. Let me read you this quote. Robert Mount says, there is little doubt that for John, the beast was the Roman Empire as the persecutor of the church. The beast is that spirit of imperial power which claims a religious sanction for its gross injustice, yet the beast is more than the Roman Empire. John's vision grew out of his own historical situation, but its fulfillment awaits the denouement of human history. The beast has always been and will be in a final intensified manifestation, the deification of secular authority. It is a counterfeit power that is self-centered, behaves as if it is fully autonomous and demands total allegiance and excessive praise. The early church expected an antichrist to come in the tradition of that little horn of Daniel and other false messiahs along the way. There's a blasphemous name on each head that will depict the claim to deity and, and desire to supplant God and receive worship. We're going to stop there, but there will be a beast, an antichrist, the second person of the false trinity that will emerge in the last days and set himself up as God. Thank you so much for your patience. I apologize. Have a great day.